Hi, everyone. Welcome to Sense of Place season 11, the last lecture of the season. I want to, before I let Joanna take over, um, tell you a little bit about her. She's a biologist and her research has focused on this animal, the pika, and in particular, how are they managing to survive in some unusual places, including the Columbia Gorge. And she's going to share with you why that is an unusual place for them. Um, she has bachelor's and bachelor, excuse me, bachelor's and master's degrees from MIT and a PhD from the Utah University of Utah. Um, but I think we probably could all agree that that is not what you really care about. I think, no offense, but <laughs> Joanna studies one of the most adorable creatures you've ever seen. And so tonight we are going to get to hear more about that and Joanna's research in the gorge and what she sees ahead for the pika. Great. Thank you guys so much uh, for being here virtually and for the introduction, Sarah. I'm so excited to be here to tell you about my pika research. Um, most of what I'm going to share with you tonight is work that was done in the Columbia River Gorge in Mount Hood as part of my PhD work, but I'll try to incorporate some more recent work that I'm doing with citizen scientists in response to the 2017 Eagle Creek fire. So of course, with this group, I don't have to tell you how special of a place the Columbia River Gorge is. Um, and indeed, that's uh, exactly why we're all here tonight uh, and the whole premise of this lecture series. Um, so I'm sure that you all know that this place has a rich human history. The lands within the Columbia Gorge are among the most culturally and historically significant in the Pacific Northwest. And this is a place that has been inhabited by native people for over 10,000 years. Um, it was also an important trade and transportation corridor and the site of one of the nation's first highways that was built expressly to promote touring, touring scenery and outdoor recreation. Um, it's obviously also a place of outstanding natural beauty and is super unique in that it's actually a river that literally cuts right through the middle of a mountain range. Uh, it's steep near vertical basalt cliffs also host high hanging waterfalls towering hundreds of feet above the river and it's actually the highest concentration of waterfalls in North America. Um, it's also a place of vibrant colors and very special light, but of course it's also a place of unique natural history and rich biological diversity. The 80 mile stretch between Troutdale and the Deschutes River is actually home to over 800 different species of plants, including 15 species that are found nowhere else in the world. Um, there are also 44 species of fish and over 200 species of birds. Um, part of the reason for this incredible diversity is due to the number of ecological niches that are created by the extremes in the Columbia Gorge. So annual precipitation in the gorge drops from about 75 to 100 inches on the upper slopes of the West Cascades down to about 10 to 15 inches near the Dalles. Um, these Pacific storms drop precipitation on the west side of the Cascades. And I think that this image is particularly striking. I don't know that there's anywhere else in the world that this rain shadow effect can be seen so dramatically. Um, anybody who has done much hiking in the gorge also knows that this is a place of steep elevational changes. So the elevation jumps in the, uh, from around sea level in the Columbia River to nearly 5,000 feet at the peak of Mount Defiance, uh, if you've ever done this um, challenging hike. So this kind of special habitat makes homes for really special species. Um, we see peregrine falcons nesting in the cliffs. Uh, in the talus slopes, we find uh, rare salamanders. And these north-facing waterfall spray zones are used by rare plants, insects, and other animals. Um, of course, another very special inhabitant of the Columbia River Gorge is the pika. And of course, that is all what you came here to hear about tonight. And the one of these organisms that I know the most about. So this is kind of an outline of my talk for tonight. I'm going to start by telling you a little bit more about the natural history of pikas and why they are sensitive to environmental changes. Next, I'm going to tell you a few stories about how pikas are able to make a living in the Columbia River Gorge, and finally, how they fared after some recent wildfires, including the Eagle Creek Fire of 2017. Um, and I'll also talk a little bit about the work of some of the community scientists that have contributed to this um, research. So American pikas, they're small mammals in the lagomorph order, which means that they're closely related to rabbits and hares. And they're about the size and shape of a russet potato. Um, in a recent very scientific sur survey, I assure you, very pristine methods, um, pikas were also voted the cutest mammal. Um, so this is something that's, that is fact, not opinion. Um, and they're interestingly also the only lagomorph to call. So they make a fairly high-pitched vocalization and the pikas in the Columbia Gorge sound a little bit like 
And yes, I've practiced my pika calls. Um, pikas have a restricted distribution to high elevation talus. And when I say talus, I'm referring to rock slides and boulder fields across Western North America. And this distribution is thought to be both limited by a sensitivity to high temperatures and a limited ability to disperse between patches of habitat. Now, unlike most alpine uh, mammals, pikas actually do not hibernate during the winter. And there's not a lot of food available when most of their habitat is under snow. And so the way that they get around this situation is by building huge winter food caches. Most animals in many habitats spend much of their summer amassing a food cache that will then sustain them through the winter. And a single pika can actually collect up to 28 kilograms of food. That's about 65 pounds. Now remember that pikas are about the size of a potato. So if we were to scale this um, into a human context, this would basically be like us amassing about 5,000 pounds of food, not counting all of the packaging that our food comes in, and making about 1,500 trips to the grocery store on each trip carrying home the equivalent of about four heads of lettuce in your mouth. So I really invite you to go uh, the next time that you're at the produce section in the grocery store, go have a look at the potatoes, go have a look at the heads of lettuce, and I think that that will help you to appreciate exactly how much work. Um, many animals spend most of their summer making hay trips back and forth to the meadow and carrying this food back. Um, recently, there's been some evidence that some populations of pikas have been lost in response to climate change and particularly in the Great Basin. Now, this map shows the results of resurveys of locations with historical records of pikas. So these are all points where we have a historical specimen of pikas, um, typically a museum specimen collected about 100 years ago. And these orange dots, what you'll notice, about 40% of these sites, these are places where uh, pikas have gone locally extinct. Now, these extinct sites tended to have warmer summers and reduced winter snowpack, which has um, led to a couple of hypotheses about how climate change might affect pikas. If temperatures, for example, get too warm, then the pikas may not be able to get enough food, and that could lead to um, overwinter starvation. Now, this is compounded by the fact that the winter snowpack actually ins insulates against harsh winter temperatures. When you actually have a thick layer of snowpack, it acts sort of like a blanket that insulates the ground. So for anybody who's done any backcountry skiing, you know that if you measure the temperature in deep snowpack, um, that you'll find that the temperatures at the bottom of that snowpack hover right around zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And then the temperatures actually get colder as you move to the surface. So ironically, this loss of winter snowpack may actually result in colder winter temperatures in the rock slides and the boulder fields where the pikas live. Now, given all of these constraints, this is a picture of where we typically would find pika habitat um, near Timberline and the Cascade volcanoes like Mount Hood. And what you'll see here is that there are these extensive talus patches um, surrounded by ample, large perimeter of ample meadow vegetation uh, to act as a food source. However, we also find some pikas in unusual habitats, and this would be places like the Columbia River Gorge. And the Columbia River Gorge, if you just look at the temperature and precipitation and the snowpack, um, this is a habitat that would predict we would predict to be unsuitable. Um, the summers are not short, there's no lasting winter snowpack, and it's a super, super low elevation. And actually, one of the, just to sort of drive home how special and unique this population is, um, what you're looking at here is a map of Western North America. And the map is showing you the minimum elevation at which pikas are found across their range. So these yellow and orange um, indicate increasing elevation. And out in this sort of red zone is, is habitat that's unsuitable for pikas. And what we generally see is that elevation increases for pikas as we go south and east in the continental US. But what I want to really draw your attention to is this tiny little blue dot right here in the center. This is the Columbia River Gorge. The Columbia River Gorge is literally the epicenter of the elevational distribution of pikas. It's the only place in the continental U.S. where we find pikas living at such low elevations. So when I started my PhD program in 2010, um, we really knew very little about this population. There were literally two papers that were published about the population that both basically said, hey, everybody, pikas live here, but we don't really know how. Um, so when I've arrived uh, for my first season of fieldwork in 2011, nearly 10 years ago, um, I found that the section of the gorge where we find pikas is characterized by this lush Douglas fir forest, and it's punctuated by these talus slopes that are home to pikas. One of the features about the talus here that struck me um, at the very beginning was this 
thick layer of moss. This blanket of moss can be six inches or about 15 centimeters thick in places, and it actually serves as a substrate for grasses, ferns, and flowers to grow right out of the talus, which are typically the preferred food resources for pikas. So again, one of the central questions of my dissertation work was how do pikas thrive in this atypical habitat? Uh, with a group of undergraduates, I collected over 400 hours of behavioral observations of pikas in the gorge. And we also placed out a network of temperature sensors to record the temperatures that the pikas actually experienced. So we placed sensors at the surface of the talus and then beneath the surface of the talus, somewhere around two to three feet down into the cracks in order to understand what temperatures pikas are actually experiencing. And one of the most interesting things that we discovered actually was that pikas in the Columbia Gorge had a really unique diet. So we are looking at here um, on this axis is the percent of the pikas diet um, by dry weight at two sites in the Columbia River Gorge that both had very high moss cover. Um, and what we found is that um, collectively, these pikas were consuming about 60% of their diet in moss. Um, and in contrast, the more typical food resources that we would predict pikas to eat in other habitats of grasses and flowers was less than 30% of the diet at both sites. And this was really surprising because basically nobody eats moss. Nutritionally, it's like the equivalent of a cardboard box. Um, but the moss is available year round and the pikas are basically living in a hay pile that remains through the winter and that doesn't require any effort during the summer to harvest. So to follow up on this observation, we collected some scat samples to be able to analyze the gut microbes. And there's kind of a growing body of literature demonstrating that gut microbes are really important in determining what plants different herbivore species are able to feed on. Um, in the lab, my collaborator, Kevin Cole, extracted DNA and sequenced the, the DNA to be able to identify bacterial strains. And one uh, strain of bacteria that was particularly interesting was a group called the Melanobacteria. Um, what you're looking at here were, uh, are the percent of melanobacteria in the gut microbiome as a function of the population. And we broke up our samples in Oregon based on the sites where the pikas were feeding on moss and sites where pikas were feeding on more typical food resources like grasses and forbs. And compared to the samples that we collected from other states like Colorado, Utah, and Montana, and to other herbivores whose gut microbes have been published in the literature, we found that this strain is super, super enriched in moss feeding pikas, over five times more compared to pikas from other states, and nearly 30 times the average reported for other herbivores in the literature. Now, interestingly, we, when we sort of dug into what is going on with this strain, we found that this is a strain that actually can't be cultured, but it has been implicated in the ability of mammalian herbivores to be able to ferment fiber, suggesting that these gut microbes may give the gorge pikas a sort of special superpower of being able to get enough nutrients and energy out of the moss that they eat. Another observation that we made during this time was that the pikas in the gorge are constructing smaller hay piles than anywhere else in their range, if they even bother to at all. Um, in fact, actually only about one in four animals even bothered to make a hay pile from our observations in the Columbia Gorge. And when they do, um, instead of this big conspicuous pile of, of plants, what they're making here is just a very small collection of plants, less than 20% the mass of their high elevation counterparts on Mount Hood. Finally, we also looked into those temperatures in the rock slides where the pikas live. So what you're looking at here is a time trace of temperatures um, and the y-axis here is temperature. And this yellow line represents the ambient temperature. So this is a temperature that was measured about six feet off of the ground and is really equivalent to what the measured weather, like what weather stations would measure, right? So these are the temperatures that you or I would experience if we were hiking in the gorge. Um, just for context here, in case you're not familiar with Celsius, um, 15 degrees Celsius is kind of like an overnight low of 60 degrees Fahrenheit, and 35 degrees Celsius overnight during high is over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So what was really interesting is that when we compared these ambient temperatures to those temperatures that we measured down into the rock slides a couple of feet down below, what we found is that there is an extremely cool and super stable subtalus temperature um, just a few feet below the surface. So this is about seven degrees Celsius, about 45 degrees Fahrenheit, like a food safe refrigerator kind of temperature that we're dealing with here. 
Um, in addition, the daily fluctuations in this microhabitat are frequently less than 0.2 degrees Celsius. And we see these instantaneous disparities with the ambient temperatures up to 31.5 degrees Celsius. So in perspective, this is basically like being in a refrigerator when it's 90 degrees outside um, and is actually among some of the largest temperature disparities that have ever been measured, more so than borough systems even tend to be. So um, circling back to our major first question here, how pikas persist in the Columbia River Gorge, um, they certainly seem to have kind of a behavioral adaptation to this to this place um, to be able to consume an unusual food resource, perhaps with their special gut bacterial friends. Um, and eating moss seems to also release them from making these large hay piles since the moss and other plants are available all winter and require no energy to harvest. In addition, it seems that pikas are able to avoid the hottest parts of the day and the year by seeking refuge in these favorable microclimates. And importantly, they can afford this since their winter survival doesn't depend on a food cache. So here I'm gonna switch gears a little bit for the rest of the talk and tell you a little bit about how I got involved in studying pikas and wildfire and then some of the results that we found. So I wanna give you guys all the disclaimer right out the bat here that I actually never set out to be a disturbance ecologist, but I had a unique opportunity to study how wildfire affects pikas. So as part of my Columbia Gorge work in 2011, I also set up a number of high elevation sites where we were gonna conduct the same methods for comparison near Timberline on Mount Hood. So this is a picture of my Pinnacle Ridge site on August 24th, 2011. Um, I was there that day, I packed up all my stuff. I went into Portland, I met up with some friends, and I started a, a brewery tour down the coast. And um, three days later, there was a lightning strike that ignited the Dollar Lake fire, um, which burned actually most of the, nor the, the whole north face of Mount Hood, um, including my study sites. So you can see from this aerial image of the burn scar that this fire um, burned, again, most of the, the intermediate elevations across the north face of Mount Hood. And you can also see here that this was definitely a pretty severe fire. Um, there are a lot of places here where we don't actually see any green vegetation for miles around. Um, the fire left behind these swaths of total destruction that um, encompassed some of the talus patches that had been previously home to pikas. So um, I actually didn't even discover that this had happened until I returned in 2012 and arrived at my field sites to find them completely toasted. And the first thing that I did was I sat down and I had myself a good cry. And I was like, my thesis just went up in flames, like literally, and I'm never going to graduate. And um, and eventually, after some time and some uh, kind words from my collaborators, I actually came to realize that an amazing natural experiment had been created for me um, because we actually didn't know anything about how fire might affect pikas, um, even though fires are increasing in frequency and severity across Western North America. So I sort of like regrouped and mobilized my crew, and then we set out to answer some burning questions. <laughs> Get it? Okay. Um, so the first question is maybe the most obvious, um, which is, could pikas even survive a wildfire? And it turns out nobody really knew the answer to this question. Um, secondly, then, of course, after the fire, we were also interested in how fire disturbance might affect habitat suitability for pikas in the future. So um, here again is a picture of Pinnacle Ridge um, in August of 2011, three days before the fire started. And when we returned in July of 2012, you'll notice that the site looked very different. Um, of course, most obviously, you'll notice that the, the canopy cover here is completely gone. Um, this site was, was really severely burned, actually about 100% tree mortality in the perimeter of the talus patch. Um, another thing that uh, you might notice is that there was this, this really um, big bunch of shrubs right here. These were like rhododendrons and huckleberries, um, delicious during observations. Um, and in the new picture, you'll notice that those shrubs are completely gone and actually have been turned into a thick layer of white ashes. And I came to learn that white ashes indicate very high fire temperatures over 500 degrees Celsius in order to turn the ash white. 
What you may not be able to see in the picture are my undergraduate students who are marking my temperature sensors. And so when we arrived at the site, we sort of stumbled up to where the temperature sensors were. And not only were the sensors not melted, which is frankly what I expected, but they actually appeared to still be collecting data. So um, we eagerly went, drove down into town, we downloaded the sensors, we looked, plotted the temperature graph, and this is what we saw. So you're looking here at a time trace of temperatures from before, during, and after this fire. The solid lines um, indicate the temperature that was measured by the data logger at the surface, and the dashed lines indicate the temperature that was measured by the data logger in the talus. So the first thing that struck me when I when I looked at these data was, I was like, where's the fire? <laughs> um, I had expected this to be a little bit more obvious. And I actually had to dig around in the fires incident management web file um, online. And I was able to find some satellite maps that showed when this specific area was a heat source. And by now having been looking at the graph for a minute or so, you might notice that it's was sort of right in here. Um, so it was actually between September 11th and September 14th that this area seemed to be on fire. Now, one of the things that you'll notice when you look at the temperatures during this time is that the surface temperatures are not really elevated. They're well within the range of the temperatures from earlier this year, um, with the exception of this little blip here in the afternoon. In addition, we find that the talus temperatures are never above 20 degrees Celsius, which is well below our best estimate of heat stress for pikas. So remember 500 degrees Celsius um, white ashes right here, just a couple of meters away, right here, less than 20 degrees Celsius. So huge, huge thermal buffering capacity. And to me, this really suggested that pikas could have survived the fire, at least with respect to temperature. So it seems like pikas may have survived the fire itself, but other habitat factors undoubtedly affect habitat suitability after the fire. And one of those um, that we thought what might be interesting to look into was microclimate. Um, in specific, we thought that there was a good chance that the fire might have affected microclimates that were relevant to pikas. And we thought that this could have happened either through a loss of the canopy cover that would affect how much sunlight hit the talus in the first place, or through a change in the surface rate reflectivity of these charred rocks, um, which might increase the amount of incoming sunlight that was actually absorbed. So we collected data at 24 patches of talus, which I will refer to as sites from here on out. And these are all sites that had previous evidence of pica occupancy. I hadn't surveyed them all the year before because I was not planning on this site or on this study, um, but we selected 24 sites that varied in burn severity. Now they were all roughly north facing um, and we wanted to maintain that north facing so that we didn't introduce differences due to aspect, but because the fire burned across most of the north face, the severely burned sites are all clustered at approximately intermediate elevations. Um, we surveyed eight unburned sites that had no burned vegetation within five meters of the patch perimeter. And then distinguishing between the moderately burned and severely burned sites depended on the percent linear patch perimeter that was burned and the percent tree mortality within the burn perimeter. Um, importantly, there was no difference in patch sizes between these burn severity categories, suggesting that the fire didn't preferentially burn large or small sites. Um, at a subset of sites, we then again place these temperature sensors in the talus. And for the purpose of the microclimate analysis, I lumped unburned and moderately burned sites together. And I felt like I was able to do this because these moderately burned sites had very little loss of canopy cover and no evidence of changes in the color of the rocks. So a temperature sensor collected data every two hours, and we use these data to calculate some hypothesized metrics of thermal stress in pikas that have been predictive of habitat suitability in other studies. Um, we know that pikas could be sensitive to heat in the summer and um, expect that summer heat stress could act either acutely through the number of very hot days or over an extended duration to produce this chronic stress through higher average temperatures. Similarly, in the winter, we expected that pikas could also be exposed to cold stress. Um, again, snowpack acts as a blanket, remember, protecting the pikas against the cold. And so we figured that if the snowpack were reduced at some of these severely burned sites, we might imagine that pikas could be exposed to more cold stress, and this could act either acutely, again, through the number of cold days or chronically um, over the season. Now, in the interest of time, um, I'm only going to show you data for one stressor, but I want you to know that all of the metrics followed the same pattern. 
So we would imagine that each of these metrics of um, temperature would vary with elevation. And so what you're looking at here on the x-axis is elevation in meters. On the y-axis, the number of very hot days. And anybody who's ever hiked up a mountain, you know that the number of very hot days decreases as you go up in elevation. And indeed, this is what we found. We found evidence that elevation affected the number of very hot days. But the interestingly, those severely burned sites, which are these red dots on this graph, did not experience warmer temperatures than we would expect just based on their elevation alone. And again, we found the same pattern for cold stress and chronic stress metrics, all of which varied predictably with elevation, but the severely burned sites did not experience more stress than we would expect. So in summary here, we found very little evidence that the fire affected microclimates that were relevant to pikas at these sites. But there are, of course, lots of other important aspects of habitat suitability for pikas, and this could include vegetation availability. So specifically, we noticed that these severely burned sites had very little vegetation remaining, particularly in the years right after the fire. So to investigate how food availability could affect habitat suitability for pikas, we conducted abundance surveys where we walked transects and recorded the locations of pikas and their calls. We also noted signs like fresh hay piles or clippings under the rocks, and we used these data to estimate the number of pikas present at each site, with the idea that abundance may be a more sensitive indicator of habitat quality and that a single individual doesn't necessarily represent a reproducing population. We also conducted uh, vegetation surveys and we uh, surveyed the total biomass of vegetation in five one meter squared quadrats. And we did this um, at five locations around the talus patch perimeter. And we did it non-destructively so that we could um, repeatedly sample the same location and not interfere with the revegetation process so that we could come back to the same place year after year. Um, I also harnessed the remarkable renewable energy source of middle school students. Um, we had a really wonderful collaboration with student groups from the Jane Goodall Environmental Middle School, JGEMS, which is a charter school in Salem, where all students had to, go to conduct an independent research project in the eighth grade year. So we worked with several years worth of um, eighth grade students together at three different study sites, and we taught the students how to collect all of the same data, which then they used as the basis of an independent research research project through their school. So um, what we found um, here, you're looking at the year on the x-axis and pika abundance on the y-axis. Each of these three lines represents the average number of pikas that we detected at each site in each season of sampling. And one thing that you can see quite clearly is that on average, the severely burned sites did have fewer pikas. However, there were a couple of other interesting things that we noticed here. First is that the abundances of pikas at all of the different site categories increased from spring to fall, which is consistent with the recruitment patterns of reproducing populations of this species. Um, and there were a number of things that appeared to be important in terms of explaining the number of animals that we see. And in particular, the um, amount of vegetation appears to be really important. So here, what you're looking at um, is on the x-axis, you've got the vegetation biomass, and that's averaged across those five quadrats around the site in terms of grams of vegetation per meter squared. On the y-axis, we have the number of pikas that we detected, and each of these points represents one site during one season of sampling. The shape of the point tells you what the sampling period is, and the color of that point indicates the burn severity. And so what really stood out to me when I was looking at these data was that there seemed to be this threshold at about 55 grams per meter squared. If we look um, above this threshold, this is sort of where we start to see the recolonization of these severely burned sites. And um, above this threshold, there are very few unoccupied sites and little effect of vegetation on pica abundance. In contrast, if we look below this threshold, what we find is very few sites with more than one pica. So just to kind of give you a feel for what this actually looks like, this is a picture of a quadrat with about 55 grams per meter squared of vegetation, and that's about two days of food for a single pica. So in summary, um, about the Mount Hood fire. Unfortunately, I can't say conclusively, but the widespread distribution of pikas and the cool microclimates that we recorded during the fire suggest that many animals could have actually survived the fire. 
Um, after the fire, we found no evidence that severely burned sites were more thermally stressful, and this may explain, at least in part, why pikas were able to quickly recolonize these severely burned sites once there was enough food available. Of course, these conclusions may depend on the fire, as well as site attributes like the, the structural complexity of the rocks and the shape of the talus patch. And so wouldn't you know it, I am so lucky to have had a second opportunity to study these things when um, the devastating Eagle Creek fire um, raged through the gorge in fall of 2017. Now, I don't mean to make light of this because I'm sure that this was as painful of a time for all of you that are watching this as it was for me. Um, watching this totally amazing place going up in flames. Um, I said I would sit there on my phone and like compulsively check the hashtag Eagle Creek Fire feed on Twitter, which seemed to be for whatever reason, the, the most like instantaneous and fulfilling way to get my news about this story. Um, and I was just hoping for updates about where the fire was and whether my core study sites were going to burn. Uh, and sitting there going, not again, not again, not again. Um, of course, as we know now, the fire burned um, most of the distribution of pikas in the Columbia Gorge on the Oregon side. And as you might expect, this fire had a pretty extreme impact on some of our field sites, um, particularly with respect to the moss cover. So you can see um, this is a site that is near Wyeth. And um, you can see that that a lot of that moss cover, you know, we just don't have that thick, lush blend of moss cover like we did before the fire. Uh, in addition, some of my surface sensors didn't fare so well this time around, um, and I wasn't able to get any data off of this sensor, but I can tell you that the surface temperature where the moss cover was burned was at least at the melting point of this plastic. Um, at some of my sites, actually, I had sensors that literally exploded. So I was picking up um, bits of, I don't know if you guys can see this here, but this is like a little microprocessor from the, the sensor. And this is the, the sensor casing that's melted to the rock. And here's the battery holder. And this is the circuit board. And needless to say, I didn't get any of the data off of the sensor either. Um, but in many of the places where my surface sensors were melted or um, exploded, as it were, um, my sensors down in the talus were not. So um, this actually now makes me the first and the second person to record temperatures in the talus during a wildfire. So um, the fire arrived at this particular site near Wyeth in the evening of September 14th. And while my sensor at the surface was literally melting, um, we did actually see a sharp increase in temperature from about six degrees to a whopping seven and a half degrees, um, which is about 45 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're still talking like refrigerator temperatures. Um, I was actually able to recover my talus sensors at two other sites, and at each one where the moss cover and the surface sensors burned, the talus temperatures ticked up a couple of degrees, but actually stayed remarkably cool. Now, keep in mind that remember on the data that I showed you on Mount Hood, the temperatures in the talus during the fire were pushing like 20 degrees Celsius, and the surface logger didn't even melt. So this is really, I think, a, a testament to just how decoupled the microclimates down in the rocks are from whatever is happening at the surface. It can literally be on fire and it, it still remains cool and constant in under the rocks. Um, in terms of monitoring the pikas, we turn to Cascades Pika Watch, which is a collaborative effort with community scientists. And I saw on the participant uh, list that some of you guys are here tonight, so hi. Um, I have been part of this project since its inception in 2011, and it's housed through the Oregon Zoo. Um, and the last three years, we've gotten funding from the US Forest Service Citizen Science Competitive Funding Program um, to help train uh, community scientists in monitoring the pikas. And I just have to say this group like really came together and sprung into action in 2018 um, to really help us try to understand how the pikas are faring in the Columbia Gorge following the fire. So in each of 2018 and 2019, we conducted some big trainings. We had a big classroom training and then a series of small group on talus trainings. Uh, and I trained about 65 volunteers each year in how to conduct the same abundance surveys that we had done on Mount Hood. And, um, and then throughout the summer in 2018 and 2019, our team of community scientists went out and collected a bunch of data. So we actually ended up with 36 sites for which we had reliable data from PICA occupancy surveys, both before and after the fire. Um, at the, in the surveys before the fire, 
which are mostly were collected by uh, myself and a collaborator of mine, we saw at these 36 sites about 84% occupancy, um, which actually is pretty high compared to a lot of other parts of the Pikas range. Um, in 2018, when we first returned the year after the fire, this distribution was reduced by about half. So um, we actually had 16 sites where um, that were previously occupied and then were unoccupied in 2018, and two sites that were previously unoccupied that actually were colonized by pikas in 2018. Um, these two colonized sites were very small sites with over about 66% unburned moss cover, which I think possibly again highlights the importance of that moss to this population. Um, but of course, by now, it's been uh, several years since the fire. And so I wanted to show you guys this little animation that shows you kind of how this site has changed since then. So this, of course, is the site pre-fire. After the fire in 2018, you see that the moss cover um, was, was really decimated and that there's not a tremendous amount of um, grasses and flowers in the, in the wings here. But um, when I returned last year in a short mission to collect my temperature sensors, um, what I found was I was actually really surprised to see that there is some really serious green growth starting to return to these sites. Um, and although the moss cover is going to be very slow to come back, there now are actually many more grasses and forbs than we saw at this site before the fire. Um, perhaps this is stimulated by the fire itself, or maybe as a result of the lack of canopy cover, providing a lot more sunshine for those plants um, off of the talus here. So um, on, along with the vegetation, it does seem that the pika populations may also be recovering. So when we returned to these sites with our volunteer network in 2019, we found that actually one site had gone from, unoccup from occupied to unoccupied, but there were 10 sites that were actually recolonized in 2019 for the first time since the fire. So of course, in 2020, the sampling was disrupted because there was some virus, um, but we're hoping to get volunteers back in the field this year in a reduced way. So I want to share one more bit of data with you about the Eagle Creek fire. And I want to tell you guys, you are all actually the very first humans to see this result. Um, since I now have nearly 10 years of temperature data, um, of course, interrupted by the fire, um, I decided yesterday at about 5 p.m. Uh, when I was supposed to be making dinner for my family to see if there was any evidence that the fire affected microclimates. Um, so this would be sort of like the analysis that we did on Mount Hood, except that I only have four sites at the Columbia Gorge where I'm still collecting data. Um, and so I'm just going to show you data from uh, one of these sites. So this is the site you're looking at here in the picture. And what I did is I quickly calculated the average temperature in August, um, which again was one of our metrics of uh, chronic heat stress um, in PICAs. So here what you're looking at is a plot of the average temperature in August at this site. These black dots up here indicate the um, ambient temperature that again is measured six feet above the surface. So again, this is sort of what we would experience. And this is averaged over the entire month of August. The red dots here then indicate the surface temperature that the pikas would have experienced when they're active on the rock slide. And these blue dots indicate the average temperature measured two to three feet below the surface, which would indicate their refuge. Now, I began recording data in this site when I first started doing fieldwork in this place in 2011, and I've maintained these sensors in three locations since then. Um, one thing that I found really interesting last night, um, it's a little bit hard to see given the scale of the y-axis here, is that there's actually also been a significant warming trend in ambient temperatures since the beginning of the study. Um, and so actually the mean August temperature at this site has uh, risen by about 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is another story for another time. Um, but the one thing that you'll notice here is that the surface temperatures and the talus temperatures are not actually really that correlated with what's going on in the ambient temperature. So that is to say that they aren't, it's not warmer at the surface in the warm years of ambient temperatures, and there's no real directional trend in these temperatures before the fire. Okay, so um, we know again that this fire um, arrived at this site in September of 2017. Um, I have data from before the fire from the ambient sensor and the talus sensor, but not for the surface sensor because you may recall that it melted to the rocks. Um, and so then what we can do is look at the range of temperatures from before the fire for these pica relevant microclimates. And what we can see here is that the surface temperatures range between about nine to 14 degrees Celsius. And the talus temperatures were basically 
basically between four to seven degrees Celsius. Um, there's a lot of interannual variability here. I'm happy to talk about that if we have time. My hypothesis is that it has to do with how much precipitation we get in August. But again, since I just made this graph last night, I haven't really had any time to look at it um, into more detail. So the next thing that I did then is look at what happened in the two years following the fire. And what we see here is that the talus temperatures down in the rock slides are really well within the range of temperatures that we saw before the fire. But um, what I found was really interesting is that this, these surface temperatures are elevated by about four degrees Celsius from the range of what we saw before. Um, and note that the ambient temperature in 2019 and 2018 is actually a little bit cooler in the two years after the fire. So this isn't simply driven by being warmer summer temperatures at that site in those years. Um, I think most likely it's because of the loss of moss and the loss of canopy cover. Um, and I will tell you that I saw the same pattern at a second site that had similar high moss cover and a severe burn where the surface center sensor exploded, um, the, we see these warmer summer surface temperatures in the two years following the, the fire. So again, this is an ongoing study. Um, I hope to return to change out my temperature sensors again this year and stay tuned for more. So um, in terms of implications of this work, we know that fires are increasing in frequency and severity across Western North America. And um, I think one thing that's really cool is that these studies that I've just shown you tonight are really the first and the second time that anyone had actually studied how these altered fire regimes might affect pikas. And there's a couple of key takeaways here, I think, um, from this work. First is the value of the talus as a thermal refuge for pikas and also for other small animals. Um, the temperatures were really quite cool. And again, this was the first and second time that this has been measured. Um, in addition, the vegetation data really give us an idea of some of the critical thresholds for the species to have viable populations, which is kind of like the, the goal of conservation and management research. Um, finally, I think it's really interesting that we're, we're beginning to have an opportunity to compare the recolonization dynamics between these two fires. Um, we're still in the early stages of analyzing the abundance data that were collected by volunteers, but we can already see some similarities in terms of the value of talus as a thermal refuge during the fire and some differences between these two fires in terms of how the fire affected the microclimates in these habitats and a much faster re a rebound of abundances. So um, for anybody who is watching right now and you're thinking that sounds like fun, I would like to help with that. Um, we would love to have you. Um, in 2021, we're gonna have really super limited capacity for formal surveys um, and it'll be limited to volunteers who have previously attended trainings. This is mostly due to COVID related restrictions and cuts in the zoo's budget and our really low administrative capacity. However, we're really excited to announce that we're going to start taking opportunistic observations, which we haven't really done in the past. And so I created a URL that I hope will be memorable enough for you. It's tinyurl.com slash I saw a pika. Um, so write that down somewhere or burn it into your brain, or you can always contact me if you need it afterwards. And if you're out hiking this summer and you see or hear pikas, we would love to hear from you. Um, use this link to report your sight sightings, and then we'll also use it as an opportunity to invite you in the following years to participate in more formal surveys in the post-pandemic future, which I'm sure is very soon. Um, one last thing um, here tonight that we are super, super excited to share with you is that after 10 years of dreaming about it, I am helping to lead the development of the first ever PICA focused smartphone app. Um, this is being developed through the Front Range PICA project with support from the Denver Zoo, Rocky Mountain Wild and an, the If Then program. And we're working with uh, Chris Sprague, who's an app developer. Um, this app will automatically record the location, the date and the time of your observation. And then you can upload photos, videos, and sound clips um, in addition to filling out this form of, about the results of your survey. Um, we're still working on some tech issues to try and get this to work on Apple platforms, um, but we're hoping that this will really help us to expand the range of people and places where community scientists can collect data on PICAs. So stay tuned. Um, as soon as this is launches into testing, um, those of you in our network will probably hear from us. So um, the last thing that I wanted to, to sort of share with you um, tonight is to kind of highlight some of the broader benefits of this community science approach. Um, and I really got involved in community science or citizen science um, because I was really hoping to help 
people to be more engaged with science and find it to be a little bit more of a trusted source of truth in this crazy time that we're living in. Um, but I've come to realize that there are a lot more wonderful outcomes of working with community scientists than I would have imagined at the start. Um, first, it's an opportunity for volunteers to get to know a scientist. Um, there's a survey about five years back that very few people could name an actual living scientist, and even fewer people could name one that wasn't a white male. Um, there was uh, also a recent study in 2017 that showed that people with more scientific curiosity are more likely to consider and respect alternative political views, um, suggesting that participating in an activity that fosters that scientific curiosity may help us to have a little more tolerance for each other and understand each other. Um, and finally, I want to sort of close with this idea that this really is not like an altruistic endeavor for scientists. Um, in many cases, participants are not only collecting real data, but also really enrich our research, um, bringing a creative perspective and fresh ideas and making observations that, of things that I would never have noticed myself. Um, so it really has, has helped me also to think about my science in new ways. So with that, I have more people um, that have been a part of this research than I can possibly fit on one slide, although you can see that I tried. Um, in particular, a lot of the data that I showed you today were collected by JJ Horns and Mallory Lambert, two of my former students, um, with funding from US uh, Forest Service, NSF, and the Wilderness Society. Um, I have a number of collaborators who have been really important in this, and of course, all of the dedicated PICA community scientists who helped to collect all of the Eagle Creek data. And then of course, thank you all for coming. Dear humans, I am sure you're out there on the other side of your computer, um, even though I can't see or hear you. So um, if we have any time, I would be happy to answer any questions. I, I don't know if you can hear me or see me yet, Johanna, but I want you to know that I did laugh at your jokes and I'm sorry you couldn't hear me and I could hear my husband downstairs laughing as well. So there are some of us out there. Um, let's get to some questions. I think we should start with the most um, important perhaps, which is um, Aaron wants to know if you will perform the PICA call again. And before you do it, um, he wondered what methods did you use to perfect that? And can you communicate with them or at least tell what they're saying to each other or other species um, when they vocalize? So you can perform an answer or answer and perform. <laughs> <laughs> How about if I answer in pica? I'm just okay. kidding. <laughs> um, so the pica, pica calls are really interesting because actually they, um, they have different dialects. And so pikas in different parts of the range sound differently. So the pikas in the gorge, which are of course the ones that are nearest and dearest to my heart, don't tell anybody. Um, and, and that I've spent the most time watching in my career, um, they sound like eh, eh. And then they make a long call. And since I was asked for this, I'm, I'm just gonna ham it up for you. Um, which is it, the long call is made primarily by males and it goes like this. Eh. And, um, but interestingly, they sound really different. So um, my family has a, a cabin up in the Uintas in, in Northern Utah and the pikas in the Uinta mountains sound like meh, eh. <laughs> and so the first time that I saw it, uh, or that I heard that, I, I was like, oh my gosh, you sound so pathetic. And then I came to realize that that was actually just their dialect. And then I felt sort of bad for having judged it. Um, <laughs> In terms of how the methods used to perfect that, um, it's great practice and a uh, long time exposed to the sound itself. Um, if you are a burgeoning pica caller, I recommend plugging your nose. It actually helps a little bit with the tone. Um, and in terms of whether I can communicate with them or understand what they're saying, um, I can sometimes make a call and they call back, but I don't think it's because they think that I'm a pica. I think that it is because they, um, I think that it's because they they are like somebody is making noise on the talus. <laughs> um, They're so, trying to help you out maybe some with your call. <laughs> exactly. So I can't understand them um, at all. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I know that they are there. Um, someone was asking about, particularly with these ones, um, with the pica population that is at this lower elevation and have limited dispersal of the abilities, how then does that affect their ability to exchange genetic material, you know, other than within their really limited population? And does that affect, or is it a problem for long-term um, genetics 
and survival? Yeah, that is a really great question. Um, so people who have measured dispersal in pikas, first of all, it's really hard to do because you basically, you have to trap them, mark them, and then find them again um, if you wanna actually measure like actual dispersal distances. Um, and that's really hard to do. Um, the longest dispersal that has been documented for an individual is about 1.5 kilometers. And so that's like about a mile and a little bit, um, which for a pika, I mean, remember the size of a potato, is really quite far, but um, but for us doesn't seem that far. Um, more recently, people have been looking into this question with population genetics, and they've been actually doing measures of genetic structure in different populations, where the idea is that if the population is more structured, it indicates less dispersal. Um, and so there actually has been a study of population genetic structure in the Columbia River Gorge that identified, you know, that there is definitely significant barriers to gene flow, even within this, this like super awesome, you know, I call it sometimes a magical pika paradise where they have like all the food that they could ever want and these really cold temperatures um, to recover from, from the heat that would be generated by dispersing. So um, yes, dispersal is something that people are starting to kind of look into again with that genetic structure. And it's something that probably will be really important to long-term viability of populations. Um, speaking of viability and survival, um, after the fires, did that alter the amount of predation that the pikas were facing because maybe they were more exposed or there was just different things moving in and about? Do you know anything about that yet? That's a great question and I don't, I don't have any answer to that. We didn't really measure predator presence um, and we didn't measure survival from year to year because we didn't mark any animals. Um, I tried to mark animals in the gorge actually and it was literally really terrible. Um, it was very bad. I think I caught seven animals over my course of like six years of trying to trap there. <laughs> Why so, are yeah. they so tough? Great question. Hmm? Why are they so tough? Why are they? I don't know. I tried, I just tried every kind of bait and just to, so that everybody's clear here, I was trying to catch them so that we could place colored ear tags so that, and then release them and, um, and be able to monitor individual level survival from year to year. And we, um, it, you know, I tried, I tried putting in flowers and Cheetos and like all kinds of stuff, hoping that we would find what it was that they were interested in. Um, my best guess is just that they are, um, we have some evidence that they have smaller um, home range sizes in the gorge and uh, exhibit fewer territorial behaviors. And so my best guess is that they're a, a little less curious about the trap in their, in their space and be not as hungry and therefore not as interested in new food resources. That's totally hypothetical, but that's my best guess. You mentioned, um, you use the phrase disturbance ecologist. Mm -hmm. um, and someone's wondering if you know if there's any federal, state, or state agency that has tried out a prescribed burn in pika habitat, or at least around the forested edges. Yeah, um, that's a great question too. I don't know the answer to that either, um, but I'm sure that it has happened um, inadvertently because you know there's lots of places where they live down in in the talus, like down in the boulder field. Um, I think that probably the the bigger issue, and I, and I like. I hope that I don't have to study this again because <laughs> just it's just really it's very difficult. Um, but I'm sure that other people will also have this opportunity. Um, you know, especially with what we're seeing in some of these big mega fires um, here in Colorado, where I'm from last summer, we actually had a fire that jumped across the continental divide. So like literally the wildfire on the one side of the Rocky Mountains went over to the other side of the Rocky Mountains. In order to do so, it had to cross through some pika habitat. So um, I'm not sure if there are folks looking at that. I have some collaborators who might be, um, and we have a citizen science program here that might be interested in that too. But I'm not sure about prescribed burn. I'm sure it's happened in the past. Um, Kim is wondering, do pikas build tunnels underground? Um, I don't think so. <laughs> um, we're not really sure what exactly they do down there, but they are not known to excavate um, this species. Now, there are other species of pikas. There's actually a, a dozen or so species, or maybe more um, species of pikas that live in um, 
in Asia in, in the Tibetan plateau. And there they are actually ecologically more like prairie dogs. Um, so they live in burrows um, in, in grasslands um, and, and do live in tunnels. Um, but the pikas that we have here, the American pika, um, is not known to, to build tunnels or excavate with the caveat that who knows what they're doing exactly all under there, under the rocks. Um, okay, smoke inhalation. And this is probably a tough one too. Any idea if that affects the pikas um, and if they, if the talus could in any way give them pr protection from that? Yeah, um, great question. We, um, I'm trying to remember what I found about this. So no actual data that I have to this effect. Um, but I think that I, I looked in the, a review of literature of fire in burrow systems and that once you get a certain distance below the burrow that the smoke in inhalation is not quite as big of a deal. Um, especially because as that fire is ripping through the smoke, most of the smoke is rising. Um, but I think it probably depends a lot on the like structure of the talus and like where exactly the fire is. Um, and I think that it's a little bit different probably in the Columbia Gorge where you literally have fire on the surface of the moss as opposed to around the edges primarily. Um, so great question. Probably it's, you know, probably it's a thing. Um, but at least with temperatures, things were good. Mm -hmm. um, okay, someone wants to know, do you know any information about the demographics of the pika populations in the gorge versus the populations on Mount Hood and Mount Adams, especially regarding the moss loving nature of gorge pikas? Is there a demographic, this, is, this person knows more than I do, is there a demographic continuum or are there discrete populations, subpopulations on that continuum? So I may ask you for that second part to put it in non-scientist terms as well. Yeah, so I think as I understand the question, and, and probably Michael, you actually know more about this than I do as well, but um, is the idea of like, uh, is it all one big population that's related to each other along the whole elevational gradient, or are there these distinct subpopulations where um, there isn't a lot of, of individual dispersal and gene flow between those populations. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, you know, there, there is definitely genetic structure within the gorge and going up in elevation and east-west, suggesting that it's probably not one big long continuum. Um, anecdotally, I have a, um, uh, Anecdotally, I've put some temperature sensors at sites that were sort of intermediate elevations. So I have found pikas going basically up all the way up Mount Hood um, at some of these really intermediate elevations. And um, anecdotally, it seems like those intermediate elevations may be more thermally stressful than either being high or, or low. So in terms of the, the temperature, the cool, coolness and stability and snowpack of the, the, of the situation. Um, it's best to be down in the very bottom. It's pretty good to be at the very top, but in the center may be more stressful. And so I think in response to that question about the continuum or the um, sort of demographics of pikas in the gorge um, versus Mount Hood, I think that there's probably some pretty significant barriers to dispersal there in the middle, if that makes sense. Do you know, does the rock size in the talus or boulder field, does that affect the uh, habitability for the pika? Um, yes. So there is such thing as rocks that are too small and that are too big. And basically, you know, the idea there is that if the rocks are too small, like smaller, the, the, it seems like their preferred rock size is basically like the size of like a basketball to like um, a microwave. And um, if you get much smaller than a basketball, so like if you have a rock slope full of softball size rocks, um, the the holes between them are just not big enough for them to reliably be able to squeeze through, right? Um, and if you get rocks that are like really giant boulders, and there's an example of this, um, for those of you guys who are familiar with the gorge, um, when you start up the Herman Creek Trail, actually there's a rock slide there just above the trail that has these giant, like they're like refrigerator to BW beetle size rocks. Um, and the hidey holes in there are just too big to give the pikas any kind of real protection, right? They can be in the hole and it's just like, 
you know, it would feel sort of like you were in like a cathedral, right? And and they they tend to prefer those rocks that are um, basketball to microwave size because it gives them enough protection and kind of close inness, but it's not um, too big. Who are what are some of their main um, predators? Um, the biggest predator is weasels. The weasels are able to um, follow them actually through the through the rock slides, um, and they're really, really fast and really, really mean. Um, they're also very cute, but also fast and mean. Um, and so that's definitely their primary predator. Um, we also, you know, there's also some degree of pred predation by hawks and birds of prey. And um, I think occasionally coyotes might get a juvenile, but um, weasels definitely are the most effective predators. Um, let's see. Will the Pike Patrol app allow for Central Oregon Pika data to be entered? This um, woman, Karen, works at Newberry Na National Volcanic Monument Bend, and they have pikas in lava flows. I hope so. <laughs> um, I think that ultimately the goal is to open up the Pika Patrol app to all of the different, there are like seven or eight different Pika citizen science organizations across their range, because it turns out that looking for pikas is really fun um, and an enjoyable activity. No, I did. <laughs> um, and the so it's starting, we're starting this with the Front Range PICA project, but I think that we'll hopefully be looking at being able to customize forms depending on the, the uh, project that you're with. Um, not sure how what the time frame is on that, but yeah. Stay tuned, Karen. Stay tuned. Okay. What, qual what qualifications do you look for in volunteers? Um, for the Cascades Pika Watch, is that? Yeah, it's, it just says volunteers, but let's assume that. Yeah, um, I think that the most important qualities are like a willingness to learn and um, interest in the project. <laughs> um, in in terms of you know the folks that I would hire as my students um, or that I would take on for longer periods of time, you know, I definitely um, am looking for people who have some backcountry experience and, and kind of know what they're doing that I don't have to like super babysit um, on that axis. Um, but for a, a Cascades Pika Watch volunteer, we are a very welcoming group. And if you are interested in learning about pikas and you are comfortable hiking and um, for the abundance surveys, you have to be comfortable walking on the talus. Um, and following some basic safety rules, um, then we are interested in you. <laughs> um, and there is, I should also say that for those of you who are looking at that and being like, oh, I really wanna help out, but I don't really, you know, walking transects across the talus back and forth and back and forth sounds really like a death wish for me. Um, we do have a, a, a crew of volunteers who also do sitting surveys. So you hike out to a site, you sit on a rock at the trail and you don't ever have to leave the trail. You just watch um, and, and kind of conduct a standardized sitting survey protocol. I'm curious if you have um, uh, colleagues that are studying other animals that are jealous because it's, it seems like your ability to get citizen scientist help would be more than like say someone needing people to go uh, look for wolverines or something. Yeah, well, well, wolverines are very exciting, and a lot of people um, want to go look for wolverines. But I think that it is true that you know, pika, pika citizen science is a privileged space among ecological citizen science, and I think it's much more difficult to get volunteers interested in sort of homelier species, you know, and insects and and frogs and stuff. Frogs are really cute too. Um, but, but definitely it is, everybody loves a pika because they're cute and they live in beautiful places. And, you know, that's why I do pika research too. <laughs> I was ask, yeah, how did you land on pikas in the first place? Yeah, um, I have a little bit of a story and, and without trying to make it too long, um, you know, as you mentioned, my, my undergraduate and master's degrees are actually in engineering and biotechnology. And um, I spent a lot of time doing work that was really important in the long run in a cold dark room by myself in a lab um, for like whole summers at a time. And when I finished my master's, I was just sort of like, okay, pause. I, I need a, a little bit of a break and some more people and some more sunshine. And I um, moved back with my parents in Salt Lake City. I worked at a bakery for a couple of months. I traveled in New Zealand and worked on organic farms, um, at which point, of course, some of my family were like, oh my gosh, what is she doing? Um, and 
Um, I think my parents are on here. So hi guys, thanks for not. <laughs> Mom and Dad. She turned out okay. <laughs> not okay. And um, and I uh, uh, read I read a newspaper article about pikas in the Salt Lake Tribune, and they in that article interviewed a woman who had a, you know apparently had a PhD in pikas, and I was like wait, what? Like, this is a thing I could do this? Because I knew about pikas from nature shows and from hiking in the Wasatch Mountains outside of Salt Lake. And I was like, wait, 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 like, I think I want to be a pika biologist. <laughs> and so I did, I sent her an email and I was like, hi, my name's Joe. I really like pikas. And I just read your article and I'm wondering what I need to do to be a pika scientist. And she politely suggested that I should take a, um, a, a, an ecology class because I hadn't done that before <laughs> and um, and ended up having uh, she ended up having a position for a technician in her lab doing field work with hantavirus with mice in the west desert and so I did that for um, uh, about a year and a half and then a she said, you know, if you want to go to graduate school to study pikas, I will support you. And so that's what I did. <laughs> yeah. Are you okay on time and putting kids to bed and all that kind of thing? And their okay. teenagers, they put themselves oh, to bed. Okay. Right. Let's do. I will do a <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, and dad, I'm assuming Michael's your dad. Um, mm -hmm. he says he was never worried about you. So oh, dad. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. So talking about pikas in Central Oregon versus those in Mount Hood, God, I feel like the pikas in Central Oregon, what, what are they eating? It sound, sounds like they'd be more dry and they'd need more sips of water to go with it since they don't have the moss. Yeah, um, great question. I don't know for sure. Um, but our, I think that what our moss data suggests is because you know, moss, like it looks like it's lush and beautiful and soft and wonderful, but like from a nutritional perspective, it's like kind of the pits. Um, and so I think that what this study suggests is that pretty much pikas can eat whatever is there. Um, and we found this after the Mount Hood fire too, that the population abundances rebounded with a like total threshold of vegetation, but not, it didn't depend on any one particular vegetation type and that included moss. So it's not necessarily that they sure love moss, but that, you know, there's some advantages, I think, um, to eating the moss as opposed to eating other things. And so um, they are, I think that in Central Oregon, you know, I'm not super familiar with the plant species there, but um, I think that they probably would be able to eat whatever um, is there so long as, as they're able to kind of meet their nutritional needs and get enough food for the winter. What's the life expectancy generally? Um, that's a good question. I don't know for sure. Um, I have a collaborator who's done a long-term track and re-site study of pikas and, um, and I'm kind of starting one myself here in, in um, Southern Utah. And uh, she has reported that they, that they, used to be um, have a life expectancy of like five to seven years, but more recently that it's rare to see them live for more than two to four years, two to four years. So somewhere in that two to two to five probably. Uh, Karen um, chimed in from Central Oregon. She said um, they do eat Forbes and we have seen them eating pine needles too. Yeah. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Karen. And that is um, consistent with what we've seen in the Columbia Gorge too. We've definitely seen them eating um, uh, pine needles as well. Um, okay, I want to read through this question. It's um, from John. I heard a pika on the trail from Larch down to Multnomah Falls area in the fall of 2019 in the middle of a burnt area. From what I recall, Cascade Pika Watch didn't see much of a population decrease since the Eagle Creek fire. Does that ring true? Yeah, so that was kind of what I, um, we're still digging into the abundance data in terms of like how many pikas we detected at each of those sites. And by we me, why by we here, I mean all of our, our um, pika patrol team. But um, they, you know, we in 2018, we definitely saw a decrease in the occupancy and occupancy, you know, uh, which is percent of sites that where we detected pikas went from about 84% down to 44%. But in 2019, we definitely saw a rebound in that um, occupancy to something closer to, to 70%. So I think that there probably was a um, decrease immediately after the fire, but that the abundances seem to be coming up pretty quickly. 
Um, are there any sort of legal protections for PICAs? Do they need it? Um, no, um, they were petitioned, uh, you know, a little over 10 years ago, there was a, a petition for PICAs to be listed on the Endangered Species Act, but right now the, the evidence just doesn't support um, that kind of action um, in terms of declines across their whole range. Um, you know, that doesn't, I don't think that any of, I think that they are a, listed as a species of conservation concern in some states and at the like forest service level. Um, but I don't know that that extends them any kind of like special legal protections the way that uh, the Endangered Species Act would. Um, I'm being reminded, and I think this is from a prior presentation with Bill Weidler, who's a wildlife biologist here in the Gorge. Um, I think that there was a kiddo that typed a question and wanted to know the color of pika's skin. Mm -hmm. I, I think it stumped Bill. So I'm curious, do you know the color of their skin? Um, you know, I, I, it seems to me from my memory that it's sort of like a gray color. Um, they they have really um, pretty thick hair for their body size and the, th the hair is pretty dense. And so it's pretty rare that you would actually see their skin. Um, but a really interesting thing um, is that some number of years ago, we actually had a, a report from a, a citizen scientist of a melanistic pica in Montana. And it was it was like literally all black. And um, I don't think that my collaborators up there ever actually trapped it, but I went to go see it one time. And I don't know what I was expecting, but it was su still surprising. Like it was an all black pica. It was just like, looked like somebody had colored it black. So um, I think that there may be some variation in that too. Um, when pikas have babies, is it a litter? Is it one? What's Yeah, typically two, typically two babies at a time. And in most populations, they time the, the um, birth to coincide with snow melt um, so that mom can feed while she's nursing the babies. And then um, the in, in the Columbia Gorge, um, actually, the, there's been some suggestion that it would be a really interesting place. Sometimes they have a second litter late in the fall, and it's really difficult for those animals because they not only have to grow up, but also find a bunch of food. And so they typically only survive if they can like happen in on a hay pile where some the owner has died, and they basically take it over. Um, so there have been some suggestions that studying pikas in the gorge may be a really great place to um, study those second litter dynamics. So. Um, do you know how long the pikas have been in the gorge? Is there an idea like what caused us to have this group here? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And no, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> um, my hypothesis is that it may be like kind of a, um, a leftover. So the, we have some genetic evidence that in general, the, the last glacial maximum, the pikas were sort of commingling in the valleys. And since the climate has warmed, they've sort of marched up the up the hill to track their preferred climate niche. And so um, we, you know, I, I think that there's a good chance that the pikas in the gorge basically were down there at that time and then just sort of stayed because it's nice. <laughs> um, that happened to a lot of us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Jennifer is wondering, so pikas, she says, pikas are related to rabbits, I think you said. Is there yes. any concern over them suffering the rabbit um, hemorrhag hemorrhagic disease outbreak? Excuse me for my mispronunciation. I think it sounds like you know what this is. Should we be concerned? Um, yes, we should be concerned. Um, don't panic yet. There has, uh, to my knowledge, so basically this is a, it's it's a hemorrhagic fever disease virus. You can think of it as being kind of like bunny Ebola. Um, and it's it's killed a lot of wild rabbits across the Western US. Um, and everybody's on edge about it with pikas. I don't, to my knowledge so far, there hasn't been a documented case of it um, yet in a pika, but there's no reason to believe that they would not be susceptible to it. And so we're advising folks to be super careful. So um, public service announcement, if you come into contact with dead rabbits, um, you know, it's really good to make sure that if you're going into pika habitat that you like bleach the bottom of your boots and, and stuff like that. And we definitely in my, um, my study site in the LaSalle mountains, we're taking a lot of precautions about that too. So good to know. Okay. Um, 
Let's see. Carrie wants to know, for those of us living in the Midwest, how can we part, be part of a PICA patrol team to help the cause? That's my aunt, Carrie. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie, you can send money to Joanna, okay? <laughs> I didn't say. research. <laughs> yeah. uh, I love it. All right, Carrie, um, sorry, you're out of luck. And Carrie, you can come visit and, and collect pica data when you're in pica habitats. Um, uh, do you have a hypothesis for where the picas will go as the weather changes more from climate change? Yeah, I mean, so it seems like that situation is seems like it's really variable across the range of pikas. So um, we're seeing some declines in parts of their range, but then in other parts of their range, not so much. Um, so in terms of you know where they might go, it, you know it it may not be a case of individual animals moving, but just sort of that the mean distribution of them is moving. Um, we're seeing in some places like an upslope retraction um, where they're you know kind of moving upslope but at some point the the situation becomes not so much hospitable to pikas at the high end of elevations like a super super above tree line because there's just not much to eat and um, the and the winters are just really harsh and really long so um, I think that that is in general is the concern um, you know that that they could be sort of like pushed up to their upper limit um, but we're not seeing the same thing happen across their whole range. Um, and so we're something that people are definitely looking into. Related to that, um, what sort of comparisons, if any, are being done between pikas in the gorge versus the Rocky Mountains and how they're individualizing in their own way in those two spots? Um, yeah, I think that definitely a lot of um, a lot of, of people have looked at behavior. Um, and that's definitely one of the things that we kind of tried to do looking at behavior between pikas in the gorge versus Mount Hood. And people are looking at kind of behavioral flexibility in the species and actually are showing that um, that as a, as a whole, the species has a really remarkable amount of behavioral flexibility in so far as they're able to modify their behavior in different contexts um, to sort of better, best thermoregulate or best find food or things like that. Um, and I think that the big question there will be to what degree are they able to keep doing that versus they run up against a limit where like they can't, you know, fix the problem with behavior. So, yeah. um, Debbie found a pika community up in the Detroit Lake area um, after the Beachy Creek fire, but then she couldn't find them um, in 2020. Um, no calls, the hay piles look deserted. She wants to go there again this spring to see if they've moved back in back in because the area didn't look too damaged. Um, is a couple of weeks a good time to check in again? When should she go back to that area to try to see if they're there? Um, I have to admit, I actually don't know where that is. <laughs> Debbie? Um, so <laughs> if, if, you, um, if you let me know, Debbie, uh, I would say in general, Here's what I've learned, at least from the gorge and Mount Hood. Um, the pikas in the gorge, I have enough data to show you that they are much less active when it's raining. So um, it's best if you can go on a day that is warm, but not too hot, um, more so in the morning and not raining. Um, as you go, if you're looking um, at going up in elevation, um, we surveyed the sites at Lawrence Lake on Mount Hood, um, which is about, um, it's about 900 meters in elevation, so somewhere around 3,000 feet. Um, that is typically, we find pike is active there by late May, early June. Um, and then Elk Cove at the timberline of Mount Hood, we typically don't, aren't able to like get in there to observe them until closer to the beginning of July. So um, a couple of weeks could, I'm presuming that a couple of weeks, it won't be super snowy wherever you're going, um, but that- It's just 35 miles. Yeah. So I would think, uh, you know, I would say that the weather is probably the biggest predictor. Don't go in the rain. It's less fun for you anyway, and you won't see anything. <laughs> um, why do you think the life expectancy is going down? Um, that's a great question too. I, I think that- you know, there have been a number of hypotheses about how vegetation communities could be changing in a way that um, affects their ability to survive and reproduce. Um, that, you know, having to, again, those hypotheses about behavior restriction and um, overwinter survival um, haven't really been tested, but that's definitely something that 
um, my collaborators are looking into in Colorado. Um, and now I actually probably have the data to be able to look at. Um, Joe really wants you to get the breweries on board with a pika beer to raise some money for conservation education research. Um, I would say knowing what I know of other scientists, you might be willing to have someone else take that on, but you would certainly <laughs> take this. I think that sounds like a great idea, Joe. <laughs> I would drink a pike of beer. <laughs> I would too. <laughs> um, let's see, uh, Jody. Yes, we will put the websites and other information because Johanna shared a lot with us. We'll put it on the Sense of Place website. So check back in. We'll get the recording up there and we'll have some. Um, of those URLs, all of them, if we can up there, I'll go back and check and see what she told us. Um, oh, Pike a cider. So maybe a yeah. cider and a beer. Well, like, and that's like a pun, like cider, like cider. That's brilliant, Debbie. You should. I think you, the Gorge, the Gorge community is, has got your back when it comes to alcohol. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and let's, one last one. Um, Lena wants to know, do you have suggestions for classes or things students should do if they want to do, I'm guessing she means research like this. Yeah, um, don't be afraid to reach out to people and ask them what they do and how they got to where they are and how you too can get to where you are. Um, so, you know, I definitely had some, um, I think I was really fortunate that I was taken seriously <laughs> in that request, but I think that you would be surprised at how many people will take you seriously in such a request. Um, you know, if you reach out and say, I too want to study pikas, um, where should I start? So. You guys, you guys asked some great questions. Thank yeah. you so much. I want to, I want to ask one of my, my own is to close this out, which is what is the next burning pika question you hope to answer? <laughs> Oh my gosh! There, I got it. And you got yeah, you got it. I hope it's not a, a burning about pikas and fire. Um, but sorry about the the uh, what I'm doing next for research is that yeah, like what do you what do you like? I want this is the thing I want to answer next. Yeah, well, so um, I have recently started um, established a field site where we're actually actually trapping the pikas, tagging them, um, and monitoring their survival, and also collecting. Um, stress hormones from their scat and as a way of looking at sort of physiological condition in the LaSalle Mountains in southern Utah. And the LaSalle Mountains, um, if you're not familiar with Utah, which of course I wouldn't blame you um, if you're not, but if you've ever seen any of the photos of Moab and Delicate Arch um, and the arches in the Red Rock Desert with this big mountain range behind them, that is the LaSalle Mountains. And they are a really unique mountain range because they are so isolated, they're surrounded by 40 miles of red rock desert on all sides. So the pikas that are on the LaSalle mountains, they're no, there's no way that they're getting off of them. You know, it's not just like going um, up, up to Mount Hood from the Columbia Gorge. And so um, what I'm really, really interested in is trying to understand um, the survival and reproduction of that species. And it's great because they actually go in my traps. So it's been so far successful. And um, we're just starting to get the first, you know, we, this is our fourth year of that study. And so we're just starting to be able to have enough data to actually start answering some of those questions um, from year to year, which is really exciting. So it's fine. The, the gorge pikas, I, I'm picturing them as like they've got this mass amount of food. They don't have to work that hard to collect it. They're living lower down in less extreme temperatures. I mean, they, they've got kind of a chill vibe about them, it seems like. Yeah, 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 exactly. I one time I, I wrote a um, I wrote some sort of article in which I compared them to um, Portland hipsters that were living locally and using green infrastructure for um, cooling their houses and stuff. Um, I thought it was very funny. <laughs> it didn't get selected for whatever I was writing, some kind of competition. They didn't like it, but. No sense of humor. I know. <laughs> um, thank you so much. I want to just thank you on behalf of all the people who have written in to say thank you to you. And thank you so much for helping bring season 11 of Sense of Place to a close. Um, there is a question here just wanting to know where else you can find these presentations with wonderful people like Johanna. And if you go to Mount Adams Institute slash sense of place, you will find our archives there um, and a whole bunch of information that each presenter has shared specific to their topic. So go check it out because um, 
people like Joanna have awesome stuff and I, and it's great that they come and share their knowledge with us. So thank you all. Thank you, Joanna. I hope um, you get to come do your research again here soon. And fingers okay. crossed it's not um, fire research. Yep. Thank Thanks you so much. Take care.